done is uh, by, we see from Europe a an enormous number of companies which are coming to Australia, which are being led by ministers and by, um, in some cases, people from the royal families and so on, uh, as a way of capturing attention and opening doors to creating uh, new partnerships. It's a competitive field internationally for foreign direct investment. Uh, it's no longer the case that mature economies or well advanced economies can sit back and just let the money come in. Uh, there, are, there is great competition, and there are many uh, uh, countries, whether it be, for example, in, in the neighbourhood of Singapore or so on, which are now as sophisticated, as developed, as in some cases even more so in particular sectors. Most countries in the world have effective and very dedicated foreign diplomatic and economic trade officials, but how do you achieve cut through? Um, it's a, a a terrible example, but in New South Wales, the state that I come from, uh, this New South Wales government um, opened a representative office in Mumbai with greater claim to say, we are now, we are committed to driving the economic relationship between New South Wales and, and, uh, and India. The trouble was is that the, uh, the opening party, the sort of thing that was to capture the attention, had to be cancelled four times because the Premier changed three times and I think uh, one of the, uh, then there was another reason for the fourth. I said to the people there, you might as well close the office because you've already made a bad impression before you had a chance to make a good one. So these are, these are some of the issues that, that really come into play. The business missions that we take from Australia to, to Europe, the first one was taken in 2006, visiting Brussels, Paris and London. This was the first time we were astounded to find that a business mission from Australia had ever visited Brussels and had ever had any contact with, uh, with the European institutions. Uh, it was interesting. On the one side, we think that the European uh, commissioners that we met felt that we were a bunch of angry farmers coming to beat up Brussels about uh, agricultural subsidies once again. Uh, which we were sort of surprised uh, by. Um, and I think some of the members of the delegation thought they were coming to meet a bunch of faceless bureaucrats who were uh, manipulating uh, rules across uh, to, to Australia's disadvantage. This was an extremely limited and uh, misleading perception that was on both sides. Yet this was only 2006, not so long ago. Every year, though, we have been going back to Brussels. And dare I say it, um, we've met with uh, about a third of the members of the Commission, we would have a longer standing relationship now with uh, people such as President Barroso, Commissioner de Gutt, Al Nunia, and so on, than members of the new federal government have. This is an important um, exercise in e economic diplomacy. Around a year ago, we, uh, uh, our organisation, the Chairman, and I met with uh, Tony Abbott. And we put to his office, uh, or to, to him, that what was really needed to elevate Australia's efforts in relation to economic diplomacy was to appoint a minister that wouldn't just be um, responsible for trade negotiations, uh, is that this person would also be the chief economic spruker, if you like, for Australia. Happily, and we're very uh, uh, proud of this, the coalition policy which was announced a couple of weeks ago, and now has been put into effect, is that uh, the Minister for Trade is now known as the Minister for Trade and Investment. The minister, this minister is, no, is responsible for trade negotiations, but very importantly, now responsible for economic diplomacy and for working with organisations such as the EABC to go to uh, important markets, not just in Europe, but all around the world, for uh, opening markets, for um, investment attraction, and so on. This represents a real shift, an overdue one, but a real shift in the way that Australia approaches this important task. Happily, I also say that the policy uh, uh, announcement that came out, uh, much of it we could see word from word from our own submission, so we're, uh, we're very happy to see that, uh, that we've, we've played this role in getting this on the agenda. In uh, the middle of this year, we were delighted uh, to have the Governor-General of Australia um, lead our mission to Europe. This was really was a first. Um, visiting the Quai d'Orsay, the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs in, uh, in Paris, um, to see the stand in the hall where Robert Schuman made his famous declaration for proposing the merger of the European common steel communities, the 
precursor to the formation of the, the European Community, to be there with Australia's uh, representative head of state, uh, to, uh, to meet with uh, the French Foreign Minister and then later with the President of France. And also to meet earlier in that day with the heads of some of uh, France's most uh, uh, important companies. It's interesting, it's probably a well, uh, not a well-known fact that of those uh, 160 or uh, companies who are in the Fortune 500 from Europe, France has the largest number. And uh, many people do not, would immediately think of oh, UK, Germany perhaps. Uh, and again, just uh, relaying how that difference between the perception of where a state's uh, finances and capability and issues may be and what the corporate sector is doing. So the, our mission is just to, to put to Australian government that we need to emulate the economic diplomacy models of major G20 partners to better attract the international capital required for the enormous infrastructure needs uh, for Australia over the next uh, decade, to and to encourage international companies to invest here. An Australian economic diplomacy architecture needs to incorporate leaders from politics, from government, from the private sector, from trade unions, be very structured and tightly focused. The uh, delegation which went to Europe this year, led by the Governor General, included 25 high profile business leaders, uh, people such as former New South Wales Premier Nick Reiner, ASPE Chairman and former uh, Senator uh, Stephen Loosley, uh, the former Chief of Staff to Prime Minister Rudd, uh, the uh, former leaders of the Business Council of Australia, Graham Bradley, Hugh Morgan, Carla Zampati, and, and the list goes on. The, program was quite exceptional and it just goes to show that with a right economic diplomacy um, strategy much can be achieved that uh, the presence of the governor general allowed us to meet with the president of france the president of the european council the president of the european commission the president of slovakia the president of austria the secretaries general of the international atomic energy agency opec and, and the list goes on now, these things cannot be achieved without the right sort of political leadership. And these are the things that uh, where Australia has been sadly lacking up to this point. Um, it also provided a valuable opportunity to present um, uh, Australia's economic credentials and capabilities, and also to encourage European companies to look at opportunities to work together with Australia in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, recent examples of visits from, from Europe include the then Crown Prince uh, Philippe of Belgium, now the King, who has, prior to being uh, uh, the, uh, exceeding as, as King, um, was uh, Chairman of the Belgian Foreign Trade Agency. That's quite a common thing amongst uh, royal families, the Crown Prince or Princess, as head of the, as the economic diplomat for their countries. We don't obviously have the same here. Crown Prince Frederick and Prince Mary, Princess Mary will be here uh, next month and will be bringing with them a business delegation, also highlighting the 40th anniversary of the Sydney Opera House. Wonderful symmetry and uh, uh, identifying the opportunities for, for ongoing collaboration. One thing that Australian uh, leaders understand, I think, or becoming to understand, is that Australian uh, CEOs and chairmen will spend generally twice a year going on road shows to explain to their investors their business strategy here in Australia. If you're running a global corporation, you have investors from all over the world, uh, then you need to be talking with those investors and giving them confidence in your strategy and also in, in your company. So too it's important for the country and the economy. I had the uh, rather alarming experience of meeting uh, one of the, the leaders of a family that has several hundred million invested in Australia and saying, do Australian ministers ever travel to Europe? I've never met one before. Now, this company happens also to be the largest landholder in Queensland, and yet there was no contact whatsoever between this major investor in Australia and, and a representative of the Australian government. And one of the things that was an abiding memory of um, the visit to, to, to Paris in particular was to go into the French Foreign Ministry and see 
models of all of the great works of French engineering, of trains from Alstom, of, uh, of planes from EADS, of uh, all kinds of um, uh, materials that were there to show the power of French industry and how they wanted to engage with Australia. Just to finish on um, trade policy and an FTA agreement which we are working on, or working on the agenda for, I should say. When Australia, uh, sorry, when uh, the UK entered into the then European Economic Community in the early 70s, there was a great sense of betrayal in Australia that markets that were once opened th uh, through Commonwealth um, uh, preferences were, were no longer there. That uh, at that stage in time, agricultural exports were far more important to Australia than they are these days. Uh, they're still important, at about six, uh, somewhere between about 13 and 15 percent of exports but it represents only 2 or 3 percent of Australia's GDP. Yet the problem, and this was one of the impetuses for the creation of the EABC uh, and, its, and its drive forward, is that the bilateral relationship should not be de determined by a dispute over an agricultural um, issues. That the breadth of the investment relationship and so much else beside really was the larger agenda, yet that larger agenda was not being um, uh, serviced at all. We've seen that in the transformation post uh, Doha that um, the European Commission is now uh, actively pursuing um, bilateral uh, free trade agreements and Australia of course has had an active program of free trade agreement negotiations as well. Many of them with the same partners, so whether it be Japan, Australia has one, Europe is seeking one. Europe, uh, America, Australia has a free trade agreement, Europe is in negotiations for one. Australia has one with ASEAN, Europe is negotiating one, and so on and so forth. So you can see there is a lot of common interests here, or overlapping interests, in terms of that trade agenda. Um, the David Mortimer, the respected Australian businessman, um, the former chairman of Leighton, wrote a review for the federal government in 2009 where he pointed out that Europe is the only major partner for Australia where there is not an active negotiation or discussion about a free trade agreement. That there are great opportunities in the services sector where uh, Europe is the, is the largest uh, partner in services trade. Uh, there are opportunities for regulatory um, uh, recognition and, uh, and, and cooperation. The ABC, our organisation, has supported this call, um, but Australia really needs to be the one to take the initiative. Europe is, of course, a, a global, uh, globally important um, player. It has a range of important negotiations that it's conducting. The significance of the negotiation that is going on between Europe and the United States can't be understated. Europe and, uh, and, Australia, and uh, the United States together represent about 40% of global GDP. Now, if a deal is struck at that level, that would be transformational. We are yet to see. But I think uh, the second round of negotiations either have just taken place or are about to take place in Brussels. Uh, but both sides have uh, set a very high bar on what they are hoping to achieve. Um, just uh, quickly to, to uh, say a few words about the EBO Global Network and then I'll perhaps leave it there, Pascaline, and, uh, and have some discussion. Um, the EBO Global Network is the organisation of European Chambers of Commerce that exist in 32 member countries around the world. We are headquartered in, in Brussels. Uh, we are uh, key global markets, whether it be uh, all of the, the BRICS, for example, um, Brazil, India, uh, Indonesia, etc. There are very complex stakeholder issues around how European chambers work with member states, a very common feature of the European Union between what is the responsibility of a member state agency and the European Union agency. What is uh, uh, the, um, a bit, I'm sorry, the issues faced by most of those organisations are very coal-face issues. Uh, the largest concentration exists in Asia where uh, the issues are very uh, challenging. Um, one of, uh, well, at a recent meeting, meeting um, one of our members in that organisation said, um, well, we're very proud we've achieved, uh, I think, 15 issues that we've successessfully advocated and resolved this year. And one of them sort of looked around at each other and said, 
well, we're lucky if we get one or two. So <laughs> these, are, these are some of the really difficult issues that, that, that uh, are faced when you're working in some of these complicated markets. Uh, they are issues of market access, of transparency, of IP protection, uh, business registration, and so on. Uh, the organisation, through its members, works uh, to organise things such as the EU ASEAN Business Summit, the EU China Summit. Uh, we have joint projects and working groups on energy procurement, automotive sector health and pharmaceuticals, etc. We meet in Brussels uh, once a year and, and in uh, a region of the world. Our next meeting will be held in um, uh, Yangon um, in uh, November, when the EU um, Vice President will be, uh, or Vice Presidents will be there, Cathy Ashton and uh, Commissioner Tajani. Um, the, this network, I think, just goes to, to summarise the work that, that we do at that international level, but also at the uh, local level or the market level. Uh, for us in, uh, in Australia, representing both European companies and, uh, and companies from Australia looking to work uh, in Europe, what's clear is that in the challenges of uh, the moves uh, in the global environment, whether it be across issues such as energy, food, uh, global governance and so on, that there is much where Australia and Europe could be working and should be working much more closely together. What it requires is uh, pathways. Uh, what it requires is high-level ministerial contact. It needs high-level business contact, high-level civil society, high-level uh, university sector and, and hence the, the involvement of Monash and other universities in that. So there's uh, a lot of common uh, agenda here and uh, where I think it really has uh, been a marvellous time over the last few years in Australia-EU relations. There is a, a very optimistic um, prognosis for the future uh, and, uh, and I look forward to, to working with the EU centre but also with all the stakeholders on uh, making some of that uh, a reality. So, Haskin, thank you very much once again for, hopefully that gives you a sense of us, our agenda, and uh, I'd be very happy to answer any questions if you'd like. Thank you very much.